Well, I'd like to ask all of our speakers, all of our panelists to please come on up here. This is the time in which you have been able to ask your questions, and I'm going to take those questions and ask them to our panelists. So would you gentlemen please come on up and join me? What a group of fine-looking men. All right, well, Tom's not going to join us. <laughs> Again, I have not... Um, Travis took your seat. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, al I'm always on the far right. So, um. <laughs> I have not, I have not shown these questions to any of these men once again, uh, but I have no doubt that they are up to the task of answering these questions. That but I have asking. one first. You have one. Yeah. Um, where's Phil? Phil, the two men you mentioned yesterday that were spreading Christological heresy, what happened? Well, they're, they both died actually. Uh, <laughs> I was going to ask about church discipline, but I don't guess I even need yeah, to. Yeah, no, right? they're, 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 both, uh, they're both gone now. I was, um, they did go through a process of discipline. Obviously, we confronted them about teaching that and asked them, uh, or actually sort of cautioned them that if they continued to uh, teach that at Grace Church, they would be disciplined, and so they were under the threat of discipline. One of them just couldn't keep it quiet, and he would always say, well, I didn't bring it up, they asked me. And so after about four incidents like that, the elders asked him just to stop coming. The problem was he had a wife who uh, really missed the fellowship. After about a year or so, uh, I went to the elders and appealed his case. I first met with him and said, look, you've, if you come back, you have to promise to stop propagating this view. And he did, and the elders sort of rescinded their order, let him come back. He was back for maybe a year and a half or so, became very ill, and ultimately died. Um, so if he had continued to teach that, he would have gone through the discipline process. Well, the list of questions that we have here, I'm going to have to strike one of them off because Tom had a question. Um, there's a, there's a lot of good questions here, so very good work, all of you, in sending these questions in. Probably we'll not have an opportunity to get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as we possibly can. The first one is not related to Christio Christiology per se, but it's a very good question, and it's this. Why is church membership important? If I attend a church regularly for a number of years and am involved, I still don't fall under the authority of the elders and the pastor, question mark. The body of believers is global. Why do I apply for membership at one specific church? And this question is for anyone. So why do you get married to your wife? Why don't you just live common law? You still make commitments to each other? Well, because God wants you to, to have a, a commitment base, a foundation so that when troubles come, you just don't run away. And when you don't have a commitment of membership, what happens is you, you can quickly wander off to another church or, or go somewhere else. And, you know, very few common law marriages last a lifetime. When you get committed to a church, unless that church is committing spiritual heresy or doctrinal heresy or there's some major problem, you're committed to that church. The New Testament church, people were committed to the church. Jesus thought in terms of local churches all the time. There are seven letters to what? The churches of Asia. The local church is critical in the life of the believer. You need to be receiving input from it. You need to be giving export. You need to be involved. It's an important part of your life. In a sense, don't, don't let me exaggerate this, but in a sense you're married to a local church in terms of a commitment from your soul. Committed to pastor 
to the pastors and the leaders to pray for them. You're committed to support them. You're a family. And so it's good to have that commitment behind you so that you don't run away quickly, that you don't run away from problems. Uh, Church membership is critically assumed, implied everywhere in the New Testament. And I would say that uh, if you're not a member of a local church and you call yourself a Christian, then don't be surprised if I'm skeptical, uh, if you, if, unless there's extenuating circumstances. But if you've been attending the church for years and you're not a member, um, I want to have a conversation with you because membership is biblical. It, it's biblical. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about purging out that uh, wayward member from among you. There's insiders, there's outsiders. There's a boundary. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul's writing about a man who had to be disciplined out of the church at Corinth, and he's concerned that uh, he might be made sorrowful over much. He said the punishment that was put upon him by the majority. How do you constitute a majority? You got to have a whole. You got to know what the, the total number is before you can talk in terms of a majority. Hebrews 13, 17 talks about elders giving account for the souls of the people that are supposed to be submissive to the elders, I'm going to give an account to God. And if you show up at our church and you attend for a year uh, and you say, well, look, man, you know, you're my pastor and uh, you're accountable for me. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Uh, there, we have a process for that that we're trying to follow in order to implement biblical church membership. And so if you've fallen into that mentality, I would just plead with you, brother, sister, think more deeply about this. You need to be submitting yourself to Jesus Christ in a local church. Yeah, I would want to just quickly add uh, the very beginning of the New Testament church in Acts chapter 2, the phrase that is used there in verse 41, so those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day. Now, what do you think that adding means? It wasn't simply that they began to show up because there were probably a lot more people who were showing up. But these were individuals that were now processed and were in that sense added. And also the very last verse in this chapter. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So again, the attendance would have been larger. But these were individuals that were now being processed and being brought into the membership so that they would be under the oversight of the apostles at that time. And so I just thought I should add that element, that there must be you saying, here is a congregation of God's people, let me be (coughs) added to their number. And I'll just uh, do what I can to sharpen the point just by going back to Dr. Beakey's message on the goodness of authority. The, the comment and comments like that, um, I think, come from a place of a, a bit of American sense of rebellion or suspecting authority, suspicion of authority. I think, it's, I think we, when we go to the New Testament, we see that Christ gave authority as a gift. Uh, Ephesians 4 Christ gave apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the benefit of the church to equip the saints to build them up in the faith. In Hebrews 13, 17, again, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. So they're keeping watch over your souls. This is a gift. And so come under, to come underneath their authority and submit to right authority in the church is a, is a blessing to you. I would just add one other aspect is just the beauty of the testimony of a church testifying to your faith. I'm not just saying I'm a Christian, but this whole church is saying to the world and to me, this is a brother, this is a sister in Christ. Um, Next question, and this is asked in an apologetic manner, but I don't think it needs to be. It says, please forgive me if this is an elementary question. I've been under Catholicism up until recently. Who or what are the elect, and how, how do they correlate to all men or the world referenced in scriptures such as 1 John 2.2, 2, 1 Timothy 2.4, or John 3.16? No, that's your verse, man. <laughs> you, you look at me. I do. <laughs> that's right. I'm done. Just staring at you until you respond. <laughs> all right. 
The elect are those whom Christ, who, who are drawn to Christ and believe. It's as simple as that. Prior to faith, you don't know whether a person is elect or not, and so the gospel is to be preached indiscriminately to all, and all are invited to come, but you know the elect, you recognize the elect, because they are the ones who respond with faith. When are the, re- when are the elect the elect? When do they become elect? They were chosen before the foundation of the world, so... But only God knows who they are until they respond. Why, why does God choose them? Because he loves them, and uh, it's not because of anything good in them. It's because it's the will of God. But doesn't, what, doesn't election then make you proud? I mean, if you believe in election, you know, wouldn't that just make you proud? Look at me, I'm elect, you're not. I've known a few elect people who do seem proud, yes. <laughs> but, but, but I don't think it's because they're elect. Uh, so in fact, there's no one more proud than the person who arrogantly rebels against the God who has sh- who's given him every opportunity uh, to be saved. I think we need to add one thing, too, to election, that, that, or not to election, but one thing about election that people often forget. Every good definition of election in a systematic theology book is not only that God has chosen certain people from the stillness of eternity past unto salvation in Christ, but also that he's chosen the means by which they will be saved. And so because we don't know who the elect are, as you pointed out, you know, we're always to place ourselves under the means because you, you never know. If you're an unconverted person, God may use that means. He may use that sermon to, to, for your salvation. If you're a boy or a girl or a teenager and you're brought up in the truth and you're not yet saved, don't ever miss a church service. This may be the time of God's means to draw you in as, as, as his elect. So it's not just a cold, causal, deterministic decision. It's a loving, fatherly decision, and God provides the means. And so if you want, if you want to get wet, you go stand in the rain. If you want, if you want to be saved... You go to church and you use the means of grace and you're in the word and you're praying and, and, and you're waiting on God for blessing to draw you in and you call to believe the gospel and you're called to repent. It's, election is not just something out there that God just suddenly turns on. It's, it's, he uses the means to bring you in. Yeah, that's a great point and I'm glad you said it because uh, it's also an incentive for those of us who are believers to evangelize. Amen. I think it's the canons of the Synod of Dort, it's like the, the charter of Calvinism that says the gospel is to be preached promiscuously. I like that it uses that word. Uh, it means indiscriminately, without regard to the question of whether someone is elect or not, we give them the gospel, and that is the means, because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That's the means God uses to draw people to himself. So in the, in the framing of the question here, you know, you have this category of all men, you have the world, and then you have the category of the elect, which, what does that imply? Yeah, in fact, uh, I came to First Timothy 2 primarily because of that extra part of the question. And um, I think it's helpful for us to realize that whereas when most of us see the word all, we're thinking in terms of everyone without exception. Whereas generally it is used in terms of everyone without distinction. And that's an important point to note. Because what was happening when uh, the Jews got the gospel was the tendency to think this is for us and not for the Gentiles. And so it was the breaking of that barrier that brought in that phrase all a number of times. So for instance, the world is basically Nicodemus being told it's not just for you, the Jews, it's for the Gentiles as well. God has so loved the world. In uh, 1 Timothy 2, it's basically the same thing. If you were to make, in fact, that little word all appears at least three or four times. If you were to make it all, without exception, you're in trouble. When you make it all without distinction, right through each time it's used, it makes a lot of sense. 
And then the last part where Paul finally says that a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth now even makes the point that this is not just the Jews, it's also the Gentiles that he's been given the task to evangelize. So that's just a little bit of uh, addition that we need to be bringing in, especially when we're thinking of world and all in the New Testament. Mm. Thank you. Very good. This next question, uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, public engagement, public theology, Christian nationalism these days. I come from a segment of Baptists who really don't encourage much involvement in our world other than witnessing. I would like to know to what extent your panelists believe Christians should be involved in social and political issues. To what extent should Christians be involved in social and political issues? There's probably a range of um, view uh, sitting up here on the panel. Uh, so I'll speak for uh, myself and how I believe. Uh, I, my, my job as a pastor is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So I have a, I've kind of got a, a training role in the church, and I'm trying to equip those who go out and do work. So I want to I make, that's my part of the disciple-making commission, uh, I evangelize wherever I can, but a lot of my work is with Christians trying to train them up in the faith, trying to strengthen them, disciple them, and train them to be disciples of other people and evangelists as well. So I do a lot of that work. And then wh whoever comes to our church, whoever the Lord is pleased to bring, uh, they've got roles in work that they do out in the world. And I want them to be the best, strongest, clearest headed Christians that they can be wherever God has them. So if I have a, if I'm in a predominantly blue collar rural area, I'm probably not going to have a lot of people who are involved in the political realm, uh, unless they're involved in something in the county or something like that. But whoever the Lord brings, I want them to be the strongest they can be. So if they're a Christian farmer, I want them to farm to the glory of God. If they're a Christian policeman, I want them to police to the glory of God. If they're a Christian congressman, I want them to rule and oversee and legislate to the glory of God. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do is disciple them to make them strong disciples, obedient to Christ, obedient to his law. If I can train them to do that well, they not only serve in the midst of the local church and the roles that God's given them and the gifts that God's given them there, but they're going to go out and be strong, clear, clear-minded Christians giving glory to God wherever they are. I'll just say one word here to ministers. Uh... You know, one size doesn't fit all, and a minister may have a special calling to, to get involved in a particular issue, perhaps, but he's got to be careful not to let that issue dominate his preeminent calling to preach Christ. At Westminster, I still remember Sinclair Ferguson saying to us, no matter what happens in life, brothers, spend your best energy preparing to preach Christ and then preaching Christ. Just what we're doing in this conference. This is our preeminent calling. But what do we do with all these social political issues? It's a struggle for every minister, I think, because it's tempting. Some of us have a way with words, so we could go out and we could be spokesmen for every issue that comes along, and we could get sidetracked uh, in our main issue. So we got to balance it. And for me, the balancing is in the areas of moral principles. That impinges directly on the gospel and in, my, and in my duty to bring gospel and law. So I'm not going to get sidetracked in every school board decision in, you know, in Grand Rapids or get involved in everything. It, it would ruin my spiritual life. It would ruin my ministry. But when it comes next Sunday, as we still remember that it was 50-some years ago that Roe versus Wade was decided, and it's now Sanctity of Life Sunday, I, I, I'm going to say something. Strong, strongly from the Word of God about the immorality of abortion and the tragedy of it, and that this problem is not resolved. And we need to be, I'm going to be praying earnestly about it from the pulpit uh, tomorrow uh, in my church because that's a moral issue. But I'm not going to tell my people, you know, you must vote for so and so, or, you know, how could you vote for so and so? I'm going to give them principles. And we teach others that they may teach others in turn. And so, like you said, 
you, 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 you're filling your people with the commitment to be whole life Christians. I just taught our parents three weeks in a row in our adult class how to raise gatekeeping children. Okay, I can't be a gatekeeper in every area of society, but I can teach my parents how to raise gatekeeping children. We need Christian politicians. We need Christian school teachers everywhere, even in public schools. We need the Christian influence. So we are like a fountainhead, and we, through the preaching of the gospel, we pour this out, and it spreads throughout the church, and then they go out and do the social and political emphasis. I think a lot of it has to do with God's providence, too, what these brothers said. You know, that's, we're pastors. I'm a pastor, and yet I found myself in public arenas over the last five, six years that I could have died happily, never engaging. But God in his providence put me there. I mean, you make a statement and then some reporter calls you and you have an opportunity to speak the gospel. Uh, last year, NBC called and said they wanted to come do an interview with me. I said, you know, great, you know, come interview me. And fortunately, we recorded it as well as they and whenever they released the interview, they chopped it up, had me answering questions that he was asking that he didn't ask when we were talking. And so we just released the, the full interview. And people were helped by that. Um, and we were talking about social, political type of things. And so, yeah, I don't ever want to leave my sense of calling before God as shepherding the flock of God, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ, but I do recognize, you know, John the Baptist said to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And when Paul and Silas wanted to, they wanted to quietly remove them from Philippi when they realized, uh-oh, we did this to a Roman citizen. Paul said, no way. You go get your boss. Tell him to come down here. He's holding people accountable for what God has ordained them to do. And in the United States, we have some opportunities that m much of the rest of the world doesn't have because we have a constitutional republic and we are a nation supposedly of laws and our highest authority is not a person, it's a document. And so we can speak. We, we have recognized constitutionally God-given rights. And uh, so I, I don't want to give that up. And I, during the things that have happened the last few years, we had people in our church coming to us weeping because they were being coerced to do things to their body with uh, an inoculation uh, or to uh, do certain things or lose their jobs. And so we were writing letters to try to help them to, to explain this. These are Christians. We're Christians. We have convictions about how we are to live together and live in this world. Uh, and, you know, I, that, I mean, we did. I had people from other churches contacting me saying, our pastors will not write us a letter of exemption. And it was heartbreaking. You know, and not all the letters we wrote worked in the places of employment. But I felt compelled that, yeah, we need to help our people stand on the authority of God's word and have their consciences not bound by uh, things that shouldn't be binding them. And, and that inevitably drew us into public arenas that I didn't wake up one morning and say, hey, man, I would love, you know, to go pray at the inauguration of our governor. You know, I, but God did that. So, okay. But, you know, uh, Joel and I were talking yesterday and he said something I've said a dozen times. If the Pope were to call me and ask me to come preach at the Vatican, I'd go. <laughs> I'd preach on justification by faith, you know. <laughs> so, I think providence has a huge part to play, and then context. There's principles that every single one of us would preach and call people to, uh, but I think of the different unique contexts that we're all in. I'm grateful that you're you at the time that you've been you and speaking the way you are. It's been all my life, man. I, yeah, <laughs> you've always been. You know, I'm in Arizona where you know I find and have found myself more over the last few years. Uh, not necessarily trying to light a fire under our people. The men in my church uh, all have ARs, and they all, you know, <laughs> our, our attitude may be more kind of standing on the edge of the driveway. Got to be careful with that word, fire. <laughs> yeah. <sorry. laughs> you know, at our church, when, when visitors show up, they say, are you carrying a firearm? 
And when they say no, they say, do you want one? <laughs> that's, that's where we are. So I find myself shepherding more people, you know, off the edge of the line, you know, with the bravado of sort of standing on your driveway, you know, you've got guys with the don't tread on me tattoos on their calves and they're saying, you know, come get some. So I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to help them be more gentle and be more measured. And also I've, I've found that telling everyone that they have to do what I'm doing in every aspect. Um, you know, like if you told all of us, you all need to be trying to go pray at the governor. You all need to be doing this. I would say, I'm not Tom Askell. I didn't get invited. Or uh, if we have things in Arizona that we're doing to try to tell Travis, well, what's wrong with you? Why aren't you doing what I'm doing with this? And he's going, man, I'm, I'm where I am and this is what I need to do. So it, I'm learning that always. I'm the young little fish in the big pond and the young guy on the panel, but I'm learning that maturity understands the context that we're in, but there's principles we always must uphold. Let me add one more thing. And, and that is, man, yeah, don't, we, we should not intentionally try to go out and make some kind of political ruckus, but the most political statement a Christian can make is Jesus is Lord. And we're living in a day when the state wants to be Lord. And so if you just say Jesus is Lord and you live like that, don't shy away from the conflict that may come and don't think, oh no, I'm getting political. And I, you know, no, if you're, just, if you're saying Jesus is Lord and Caesar's saying, wait a minute, no, Caesar's Lord. Well, just realize you're following in the path of brothers and sisters who had their heads severed from their shoulders uh, long before we arrived. Politics was my hobby before I became a Christian. And one of the things that became really clear to me in my conversion is that the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And I realized that the solution to what ails our culture isn't a purely political solution. You can't, we're, I think Christians today have a tendency to think that if we could just elect the right guy, everything would be fixed. And it doesn't work that way. And if anybody ought to understand that, it ought to be the church. Uh, and so as a Christian for more than 50 years now, I've tried as much as possible to steer clear of partisan politics. But uh, like Tom said, in, in the culture today, uh, the, the machinery of government and politics has been turned deliberately against the church. And so it's, it's getting harder and harder to uh, be faithful and preach the Word of God and be a pastor and steer completely clear of politics because so many of the issues that are hotly debated today really do have uh, important moral implications that are rooted in Scripture. So my answer to the question is, look, I want to speak the truth plainly uh, and, and basically take the consequences. I, I, I don't think the solution, I still don't think that the solution to what ails our culture is uh, politics. And so I have zero hope that how I vote is going to fix everything that's wrong with this world. And so your original question was from someone who said, the emphasis in our church is evangelize. I think that's actually a good emphasis. Uh, I don't think you can be totally quiet about political issues, but I think the most important thing, and I think every one of these guys has already said this, the most important thing we can do is preach Christ. In a world where everything is made political, evangelizing is political. So politics is coming to us, and we need to, again, train, equip, and shepherd our people as the questions come to them and as they're challenged to give an answer for the hope that's within them, they have to answer. They have to address the issues that are coming to them, give them an answer, give them a reasonable answer. Next question, in Christ's incarnation, he added to himself a second nature, but not a second person. How do we distinguish between nature and person? That was your message, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> you, did, you did a little bit of research in that message, I think. I did, and, uh, and that's, a, that's a huge question, all right? Uh, probably beyond my pay grade to give a, a, a full answer to. But uh, let me just say this. That that's why we have Joel on the panel. Too, I know. Okay? That's why I looked at him to answer this. Uh, 
so, but uh, you have to, you do have to distinguish between uh, person and nature because if you say Christ is two persons, well, that is Nestorianism. I mentioned that, that the, the idea that Christ is actually two persons in one body, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a heresy. Uh, plus, if you, make, if you make the humanity of Christ a completely separate person, now you've got, what do you, have you got an extra person in the Trinity? And how are you going to multiply this? So you have to make the distinction. Does the human mind of Christ constitute a different person or a different personality? Or does that just pertain to his human nature? And the answer is, it's, it's, it's just his human nature because Scripture is very clear that he is one person and uh, one divine and human person. And you, if you mix those categories, you're going to end up with a real mess. Fundamentally, it's, an, it's incomprehensible to us like the Trinity is. The, tr the Trinity, one divine nature, three persons. How do, I, uh, how do I make those distinctions or understand? I, I know that there's a distinction between the persons. There's a singularity in the nature. I don't understand how that works. It is incomprehensible to me, and it just gets more incomprehensible when I think about the incarnation of the divine nature and human nature in one person. I don't understand that. Right, but it is important to keep to the categories the separate That's because right. otherwise if you say three persons, that, uh, what constitutes a person? Is it, is it a distinct mind? No, because in, in the Trinity, they are, they are united in essence, and there's only one mind in God. Uh, it's not th three distinct minds. And I think people tend to, tend to mess up their thinking like that. Like, we think that Christ has his mind, the Holy Spirit has a separate mind, and God has a separate mind. And that each of them has a separate will as well. Uh, and that's just not the case. There is one will in God, and so that pertains to what we, what we refer to as the nature. The divine nature is one, but three divine persons. So I was 21 years old when I uh, entered seminary, and my theological teacher sat me down and said, well, I'd like to just see where you're at theologically, see how much theology you know. So I just have one question for you. When Jesus was sweating, when he was tired, when he went to sleep, um, when he was in agony, in what person did he experience these things? And I said, well, in this human person. <laughs> he goes, no, we, we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> So I try to explain it to my high school class this way, that say you have, I mean, this is just a picture, but say you have Christ's deity here. His humanity he assumes into his divine person, but it doesn't penetrate into his divine person. It's, it's connected to it. It's not separate from it, but it's also not merged with it. And at that point, you go where you go, is how do you understand this? The comforting thing about it is that his deity is also always undergirding his humanity. And his deity gives give reason to grow your assurance of salvation because he cannot possibly sin because he's God. So that's that's very comforting. And so we also ought not be troubled that we can't comprehend it. God is God. The old divines used to say, if you can comprehend God, God would no longer be God. So it's natural that his Trinitarian relationship is incomprehensible. That, his, that the person and the natures of Christ, how they combine, are incomprehensible. But as Phil has been pointing out all weekend, there's so many different errors that could be made as we try to grapple with it that we need to protect ourselves from all sides. And we need to just bow under God and say, this is what the Bible says he is, and we adore him and we worship him. I remember L. Martin saying, it would be like an ant crawling on the ground 
looking up at us, if the ant could speak and saying, oh, I fully comprehend you and your brain and all that you are. What? You're just a little measly ant. You don't understand human being. That's like us looking up at God and saying, well, if I were God or, uh, you, know, I, you know how people talk today, then I would do it this way. That's this blasphemy. God is God. You're just a little ant at his feet. And don't pretend you can tell God who he is or understand him. We can't even come close to understanding God. So Luther said, I worship a comprehensible, incomprehensible God. Comprehensible insofar as I need to know him unto salvation, but incomprehensible, surely, in terms of who he is in all his glorious essence. If I could add just a little footnote to that, as, as God is incomprehensible, that incomprehensibility is no excuse for theological laziness. So I think sometimes we, we come into a theological difficulty, and as soon as our brains hit that wall of difficulty, we say, no, oh, well, it's incomprehensible. But we need to keep pushing further up and further in, in, in worship. Well, that's why Calvin said, you know, we, we use our minds as far as the boundaries of Scripture go. As soon as we go over the fence of Scripture... Then we're into our own territory, and then we, we kind of become godlike. You know, this is what God is like, what we think. It's not about what we think, it's about what Scripture says. So we stay within the boundaries of Scripture, but then, yeah, use our brains as far as we can go. But that's why Solomon said, God has put eternity into the hearts of man. It's, 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 what, it's what we long for. We do long to comprehend, but we end up, and we can apprehend much about God. We can apprehend it that we can't fully comprehend. Because we can't, if we were to comprehend and encompass God, then we are God. We're not God. We're finite. We're limited. He's infinite. But we continue to have this desire to know, desire to understand. And that should never be shut off. In fact, that, that desire to investigate and explore should be encouraged. We need to cultivate that curiosity. And yet within humility, within our limitations, in our uh, finite understanding. Yeah, yesterday I recommended uh, William Cunningham's two-volume book on historical theology. To whoever's struggling with that question, I would recommend, rather than try to think it out on your own, read historical theology, read, and, and I do recommend William Cunningham, where he chronicles the debates that, uh, that took place in the early church over the incarnation of Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, and you'll see how these terms came into common use. Uh, but again, if you, if you mix those categories, if you, if you want to say that Christ is actually two persons, you're, you're square in the middle of heresy. In, in his book on the Trinity, Augustine says, I'm writing this not because I can explain it, but I speak so as not to be silent. The Bible's revealed it. We want to communicate it. And we do the best we can knowing that we're standing on holy ground and we're ants. Um, connected to what you were talking about, Phil, when it comes to the one will of God, this is a bit of a theological can of worms. Um, and somebody will probably have to explain the question, but it, it asks, is there authority and submission ad intra in the Godhead? I was hoping you wouldn't ans ask that question. <laughs> I didn't, they did. Because I have, I have good friends who are on uh, the opposite side of this question from me, and I don't want anybody to think that I'm targeting anybody in particular, but uh, in my judgment, no. I think any kind of subordinationism that you, that you try to inject into the Trinity is going to lead you astray, and, which is not to say that everybody who currently, and, and it, this is a current debate, as many of you know, uh, I'm, I'm not suggesting that everyone who's saying that there's a sense in which the Son is eternally subordinate to the Father, I'm not saying that's a damnable heresy and so I don't regard them as true Christians, but I am saying I think it's a dangerous enough error that in subsequent generations, the people who have been taught and imbibed that idea are going to veer into heresy. I think it's inevitable. Yeah, this is a this is a tough debate, and like you, I got friends on both sides and friends opposite me on this. I think you and I would be in the same camp on this issue. Uh, Tom Nettles wrote two articles for Founders at the height of some of this debate five or six years ago, 
And I think he went as far, certainly as reading it, as far as I'm comfortable in going and trying to honor those who do believe there's some type of eternal subordination uh, in the Trinity. And uh, he builds it off of the nature of the fatherhood of the father and the sonship of the son. I mean, he's always been the son. He's always been the father. And so there's, there's relational realities to that that in no way diminish the um, deity or the integrity uh, of, of either but it is a relational reality. And so the danger is we tend to want to import our thinking about fathers and sons into that, and that's we get into a mess there, and we don't want to do that because it's, it flows the other way. But it's there, and God revealed it. And so Nettles is really careful, I think, in trying to show, okay, these brothers that are talking about eternal subordination, uh, they're trying to honor the reality that the Father's always been the Father, the Son's always been the Son, the Spirit's always been the Spirit in our one God. And that, again, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. So we need the guardrails up to make sure we don't go over the edge, uh, but we need to be, I would love to see this debate being carried out with greater humility and charity than it oftentimes is. Yeah, amen to that. And to echo what he said, uh, I think it, we live in a culture where we impose some ideas on the idea of Father, fatherhood and sonship that you don't find in Scripture. If you just read the Gospel of John, remember, the Jews would speak of God as our Father, but they were offended when Jesus called him my Father. And Scripture says, I think it's in John 8, uh, that they took up stones to stone him because he made himself equal with God by saying he's my Father. Well, that's the way it worked in in that culture, uh, the son was considered equal to the father. In our culture, the son is always kind of subordinate to the father. You know, you you you, uh, you, you don't think of uh, Donald Trump's son as his equal. He's 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 lesser than his father. And and yet, in the biblical culture, when Jesus said spoke of God as my father. The assumption was he's making himself equal with God, which indeed he was, declaring his equality with God. And, and so I, I think that's what Scripture consistently tells us, that there is this equality in the Trinity so that uh, Christ is spoken of as the one who created the world. You wouldn't get that from just reading the book of Genesis. Um, but he's equal with God in every way, and because they have one mind and one will, all of their operations are, are together. Um, turning the page a little bit, different question. Should we eliminate songs from Bethel and Elevation and Hillsong from our, our worship services? Costi's struggling because he hasn't quite done that yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> We've taken a position on this. Um, I've often said, whether people hear it or not, that our convictions or my convictions don't need to be everyone's commands. Uh, there are our faithful churches who sing a lot of different songs that are theologically true, uh, where my concerns come in with movements like Bethel and Hillsong and Elevation is they're actively spewing heresy. More than that, they're actively targeting the next generation. And music is highly influential. We know that. I uh, know that there's been many men and theologians who have said a congregation doesn't learn its theology only from the sermons that the preachers preach, but from the songs that they sing. Uh, there are people who say, well, what about it is well with my soul, Horatio Spafford? You know, I guess we're all just stumbling into heresy now. And, you know, I would say that there's no Horatio Spafford uh, supernatural school of ministry that's inviting my kid to go there and pay tuition uh, to fall into some canonic heresy. Uh, also, Bill Johnson and these movements have stated that music is their gateway. They're using music in the arts to target uh, a generation. And so in that they've made it their weapon of choice. I think it's important to at least have a position or a conviction. I've had good discussion with brothers. I've actually made some of my 
my dearest friends locally from this debate. I uh, had a lot of different lunches and coffees uh, with pastors who were real, real upset one time when I said uh, to a question on a Q&A interview, uh, should I leave my church over this issue? And I said, if you have a conviction, yes. And the reason I said that is because people have a difficult time, sheep have a difficult time in some of these circles. And that led to good discussion. And I remember one of the pastors saying, you know, you're trying to poach our sheep or you're trying to steal sheep. And I said, I, that's not the goal. I don't care where they end up as long as they're in a faithful church. But we ended up talking about it. And from that conversation, they uh, added in a process where they theologically vet music. And that's what I implored them to do. I said, look, I, you, you can do whatever you want. It's your stewardship and you'll face the Lord. But if you have no system and your, your answers are weak, then in today's culture where people Christians consume a lot of media, and I mean that in a good way. We have more access to things than we ever have. People are more discerning, and pastors ought to have some sort of answer at the very least. And I think Christians today are more demanding in the right way and more expectant because there are conferences like this, and they go home, and when pastors sort of take the old position, well, I don't get involved in, in politics. We don't talk about that here. And they go, well, can I have answers for the context I'm in? Or they say, well, don't worry about the music. You know, it doesn't really matter. And I think that's not good enough uh, for folks. And so in that, I think churches should have, to some degree, a clear answer and a clear understanding. The last element would be uh, the financial support. And I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, now every restaurant you go to and everything has to be vetted. Um, you know, you can't go to a restaurant owned by an unbeliever. But these groups are financially benefiting in massive ways uh, from the use of their music. And uh, time and time and time again, when we do that in our churches, I think, you know, it's just unwise to support them. There's probably more to it, but hopefully that helps. Positively, I'd say there, are, there is such good hymnology in our history to use in the church that's so theologically sound and instructive that if you occupy your church and yourself with those hymns and songs in the church, you're not even going to have time to take any interest in Bethel music, Hillsong, Elevation music. And even when you, when you put them side by side, you're going to say, why would I, why do I choose McDonald's when I can get this Really juicy steak. Mm. <laughs> so that's what I want to serve up to the people. That's a good point. I agree with these brothers and appreciate it, uh, what they say, and that's where we are. I, I want to extrapolate a little bit, though, because uh, this is an issue that we've had to face as elders regarding authors and books. Um, there are some really good books that were written 20 years ago by men that I cannot commend today. And so if we keep their books uh, available then folks will read the book from 20 years ago and say, man, this is great. And then they go get, read the book he wrote last year, and they're going to be led down bad paths. Uh, so we typically will remove those books from those guys and give them out only with greater discretion to more discerning people. But I, how do you guys do that? What, what do you do with that, Conrad? Yeah, well, I was really processing this as uh, you men were talking, and um, there were two things that I wanted to to mention. One is on the end that a lot of our people back home in Africa, largely, don't know who has written what songs. They simply know the songs that they sing. So in that sense, we tend to concentrate more on the theology that is in those songs. However, a lot of our young people are beginning to not just know who the authors are, but also the, the debates around those individuals. And so where it becomes evident that because of that individuals are stumbling, then yes, we would not want to stumble God's people because we've become a global village. We, coming to Kabwata Baptist Church specifically, we have one of our elders who is musical, he's knowledgeable in that area, and, and he is the safe guide that we have, We're talking about gatekeepers, to ensure that we are moving on the rails in the realm of music that's really helpful in, in, in the congregation. Finally, 
it's simply the statement that someone once made that when the devil was was cast out of heaven he sort of fell in the choir loft or something <laughs> you know the the whole realm of worship and music and so on often will end up with its gray area rather than black and white and so we do have to give one another a little bit of space thank you very good well, i think this is our final question for this morning and this is connected somewhat to your talk on the authority of christ dr Beeky. Um, what is the difference between Jesus' reign as sovereign God before the incarnation and his reign as sovereign God after the incarnation? Also a bit of a can of worms. My mind is still on the music question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can go back to that if you like. I, I, was, I, was just think, I was just thinking if you all did what we did, we'd, we'd have no problem. You sing the song. Sing the song. Sing song. Sing song. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you repeat the question? <laughs> What is the difference between Jesus' reign as sovereign God before the incarnation and his reign as sovereign God after the incarnation? <clears throat> yeah. I think it's so hard for us to grasp. We're 2,000 years away from Jesus on earth. The radicality, the earthquake nature of his becoming incarnate, suffering, dying, and particularly being raised from the dead, and then ascending to heaven and reigning from heaven in his sovereign power, that we just, we just can't grasp it. Had we lived in that day, it, it was very different. Like today, when we walked in here, what do we say to each other? Good morning. New Testament Christians would never have said good morning to each other. They said, the Lord is risen. The Lord is risen. I mean, now he's ascended on high and he's got all power and authority given to him in heaven and earth. And so, of course, Christ was reigning in his sovereign power all, all the time from heaven. But now he's actually come and now he's displayed himself in a human nature as well. And there's just so much more now. Everything is bigger, broader, wider. Uh, he's now the covenant. He now establishes his covenant with the Gentiles. And, and now he's, he's, he's Lord over the Gentiles and millions of people all over the world are being saved. So think of it this way. In the Old Testament era, everything is waiting for his coming. And the gospel has been revealed primarily, a few exceptions, just a one little pinprick on the globe, that little place we call Israel. Just a tiny little place. But now he's ruling over everything in his kingdom of grace as well and bringing the gospel to all the nations. He's a sovereign king. So I like what Sinclair Ferguson had to say about it. He said, it's the same Christ. And in a sense, nothing is new because he's always been the sovereign Lord. But in another sense, everything is new <laughs> because now the gospel's all over the world, and uh, all those who hear him and reject him will be thrust into the center of hell because they've rejected this sovereign Lord and King who offers himself to them. And those who do hear him and do receive him from all nations, they'll be around the throne of the Lamb, and the Lamb will be sitting on the throne and the millions upon millions, the numbers will be innumerable, will be in that heavenly choir singing his praises, glory and dominion and honor be unto you, O Lord, forever. So in a sense, there's no difference. In a sense, there's just a huge difference. One of the things that has come home to me more in the last few years on that very point is that he's the mediator now. He was going to be the mediator, I mean, in our historical uh, uh, outworking of that. But the mission that he came to accomplish via incarnation, atonement, resurrection, it's the same mission that he is now orchestrating, yeah, as the sovereign Lord. So it's not, I mean, God always has had this in his mind, but the God man is sovereign now, which wasn't the case 
prior to the incarnation. He was not the God-man. And so all of that, when you start thinking about everything we read in the New Testament about why Jesus came, well, that's still going on, but now it's going on, and, and he's ruling and reigning. He, he's not here enacting it in flesh, but in flesh in heaven. He is ruling and reigning and positioning everything to make certain that that mission is finished. And it, it just adds something to the, the thought of his sovereign rule as the God in flesh mediator. Yes, yeah, so we can say of all of history, including eternity future, there's a three-stage process. Prior to the incarnation, it's the not yet age. Now we're living in the now not yet age. And when he comes again in the clouds, as we're going to hear momentarily, and we enter into eternity, we're in the, as believers, we're in the now. And there's no more a not yet stage. There'll be yet another stage coming in which that sovereign power will be manifest far more than it is even now. Hmm. Amen. Well, please give our panelists a big round of applause. Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs>